It is the Lord's Day, and we are blessed to come together. If you're joining us on Facebook Live or any social media, thank you for joining us. If you're in the area, please stop by and see us. Happy Father's Day. If you were unable or if I did not give you a little compass, there's some on the back tables here in the auditorium. would love for you to grab one. It's got a little scripture on the back side and everything. Uh, just a little gift to say thank you so much. I'm super excited. When we started the series on stories Jesus told last week, I, the, the correct order would have went ahead and do the prodigal son today, but I didn't want the fathers to think that I said they were prodigal sons. <laughs> so prodigal son is next week. So we're looking at the parable of the talents. And the reason I chose that for today is I truly believe that we are blessed with fathers that are so talented, they have invested into our children and to other children and have been a blessing to the Spanish Fort uh, community, especially our church family here. And so we just give you praise for taking what God's blessed you with and truly investing it into your family and into this wonderful church. So thank you so much for that. There is a picture booth set out in the back. Uh, in the foyer, please stop by and get your picture made and love for you to post that either on our Facebook page or your page, uh, uh, kind of link us to it. We'd love to see that. I uh, love seeing pictures pop up of our church family for sure. Super excited. If you notice on the uh, uh, slides before the, uh, I can't even get it out this morning, before service this morning, our VBS is coming up pretty quickly. We have 98 children already registered which is outstanding outstanding so if you've not registered yet please do that uh, we're looking forward to having a great great time I've been hearing stories about the skits and, uh, and other things so super super excited about that I hear there's an Australian man or something uh, you know I just I, I'm hearing some stories so I'm super super excited about our VBS so but again, thank you for being here with us this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to jump right into our service now. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the many blessings. But Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together as a family and to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, help us to dismiss worldly things from our minds so we can truly lift our voices up in praise to you this morning. Be with us as we gather around your table. Be with us as we open up your word this morning. And Father, we pray that everything we do here this morning is according to your word and well-pleasing in your sight. Father, we love you so much, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me.
today's scripture reading will be coming from Matthew chapter 25, verses 19 through 21. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master.
I was driving in this morning to worship, there was a, uh, a Zach Williams song that came on the radio that reminded me of what I was wanting to, to, to pray about this morning. And one of the verses in the song is, You rescued me, and I will stand and sing. I am a child of God. Amen. Before prayer, I want to read a verse. 1 John 3, verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with hands praised. And Lord, we come to you with hearts of thankfulness. Lord, we're so thankful that you are our Father, Lord. You're the one that created all things and the one that provides all blessings to us. Father, there are many of us who at some point in our lives have turned our backs on you, Lord, but like the prodigal, you not only took us back, but because you're such an amazing Father, you received us with joy, with love, and you bestowed your greatest blessings on us. Lord, we pray for those who are going through difficult times right now, Father. You've shown us your constant faithfulness. Lord, just let our faith be real and let it be true as it can be so difficult sometimes to truly lay these things down at your feet. Father, we pray the leaders of this church, Lord, we pray that our worship will always be in truth and as you desire and that we will truly be a church who is striving to be the hands and the feet of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the safe return of our mission team. Lord, we ask that the seeds that they planted there be a bountiful harvest for you someday. Father, we're especially thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, for his love, his words, and his path to salvation that he provided. Lord, we thank you for, our, for your spirit that dwells in us, Father. That spirit that gives us strength and comfort and direction. And Lord, we just ask that we listen to that spirit as it leads us through our lives. Lord, we ask your forgiveness for our sins because there are many. And Lord, we just ask that you make us more of what you want us to be every day. Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name, our King. Amen.
what we do now in every Sunday is to remember our Lord and Savior. How you choose to do that or how you do that, I can't affect that. But on Father's Day, I, I, I want to make a few comments. Some of us doesn't have a father anymore. Some of us didn't have a good father when we had one. Some of us have fathers that are very special, very godly men. When you think about Christ and the relationship he had with his father, it was a perfect situation. You look back at Christ when he died for us in that moment. There were several things he said there. One of the things he said while hanging on that cross was Matthew's interpretation. And again in Mark, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people say that God had to turn his back on his son because of our sin. Some people say that God would never turn his back on his son. At one other time in scripture we read those words when David was struggling in Psalms 22. David said, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Well, we know that God was always there. In David's case, in Christ's case, God was always there. God is always there for you and me. Regardless of our relationship with our earthly father, God is a God of love. And the reason that Christ went to the cross for you and for me was because his father loved us as much as he loved him. We have an opportunity now to remember Christ and the sacrifice that he made. We have an opportunity in that to remember the love that was there and that is there. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're so grateful for you, for your love, for your plan to redeem us. We're thankful, Father, for your Son, we can only imagine how hard it may have been for you to watch him. But we're grateful that you allowed it to happen. We're grateful for him and his willingness to die in our stead. And we're thankful, Father, for this Lord's Day and every Lord's Day that we have to remember that precious body that hung suspended on that cross in our stead. Help us now, Father, as we partake of this bread to remember your love, his love, and what it has done for us. Be with us as we partake. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, as we continue our prayer of thanksgiving, we're so grateful again for this opportunity, Father, to remember 
your son, our Savior, to reflect upon that sacrifice, the shedding of that precious blood, Father. He gave his physical life that we might have spiritual life. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity that we have to be washed in that blood, to be cleansed, to be righteous because of what you have done. Father, help us through faith to live a life knowing that we're saved through your son. Father, we're thankful for the shedding of that blood and the opportunity that we have now to remember it as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Be with us as we do so. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. As we think about the blessings that we have in Christ, the spiritual blessings cannot be measured. The physical blessings also come from God. Scripture tells us that God gives us all good and perfect gifts. And sometimes we focus too heavily on the physical because that's the life we live. But it's so temporary compared to where we are going. And our thoughts right now is on what are we giving back to God? It's all his. When we're gone, somebody else will be a steward over it. But we have an opportunity to praise and glorify our Father by using the things that he's given us to serve him by serving his people. We have an opportunity to do that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you allow us to be, especially spiritually. But now, Father, we're mindful of the physical blessings that we often take for granted. Help us to realize, Father, it's all yours, and we're just stewards responsible for using it. Be with us today in the lesson that Berlin will bring us. Help us to understand the talents, the abilities, the blessings that you give us and, and the opportunities that we have to use those things to bring glory and honor to you, to exemplify Christ, to edify each other, and to evangelize the world. Guide us, Father that we might do that in full accordance with your will. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.
Matthew chapter 25 begins in verse 14. For it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talent more. So also who, he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You had been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who, has, who he has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not... Even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When we read this parable, when we read the story that Jesus is telling, and we said a parable is just an earthly story with spiritual or heavenly meaning behind it. And as we read this story and as we look at what Jesus is talking about here, we see that the master is God, and we are the servants. And we're going to see today that God has given us all talents. And I want us to look at seven principles, and I don't let that scare you because they're fairly quick. Seven principles that we learn from this parable that Jesus tells here. And one of the questions I would like to ask is, when your life is over, what will you use to determine if your life was worthwhile or not? Will you look and say, well, my bank account has a lot of money in it, so my life was worth a lot. Or how many followers I have on social media? Or what's my title? What is it that you will use to determine if your life that you're living right now was worthwhile or not because the greatest use of your life is to invest it into that which outlasts that that will last an eternity I'm so thankful for our mission team they got back in at two o'clock this morning and I think most all of them are here this morning that speaks volumes right there they spent seven days away from us doing God's work they invested their time of what God has given into these children, into these adults. And whether they realize it or not, those children are investing into our mission team also. But it's not just our mission team. Our children coming forward in the mornings to give money to help with that cause. You on Harvest Sundays and other times giving to make this possible. That's investing and that which will outlast. And I just want to say thank you to our mission team for just the great job that you've done. And I pray for the other team that's down there. This is the third week that gets started this week. Our team went the second week. And so there's still some on the ground in Jamaica this week. But as we look at this, here's the principles I want you to see. Number one is ownership. Principle of ownership. Everything I have belongs to God. 
Psalms chapter 24 tells us the earth and the Lord is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything that you and I have belongs to the Lord. Do we see that? Do we understand that? I believe if we truly understood that everything we have belongs to the Lord, our, do, our giving, and I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about our giving and our talents and our efforts, even in our money, would double. If we could just understand everything I have belongs to the Lord. We just get to use it for a few years. In Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 2, we see that man was, God made man to manage his resources. In our parable there in verse 14, it says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted them to his property to them. Who did the property belong to? The master, right? It did not belong to them. The master has come and given them money, talent here. And so we understand who owns this. Just as the master entrusted his servants just for a short period of time, God has entrusted us, you and I, with different things for a short period of time. Do we understand that? Do we see that? But everything that I have belongs to God. But Verlin, I went to school. I went and got a four-year degree. I even went back and got a master's degree. I may even got a doctor's degree. Who gave you the mind to be able to do that? Who gave you the resources to be able to go do that? God. But Verlin, I've got a job. I'm de- Who gave you that ability? God. So the, own, the principle of ownership, everything that I have belongs to God. The second principle is allocation. God has given me some talents. Now the word talent that we use uh, today referring to our ability comes from this story. And in this story we see that it originally was meant to be a measurement of money. A one talent is uh, about 6,000 denarii. One denarii is a day's wage. So do the math right there. One talent would be 20 years of wages. Quite a bit of money. And so even the one talent man has quite a bit that was given to him. Now the definition of talent that we use today is anything that God has entrusted into our care. It may be opportunities, it may be resources, it may be money, it may be abilities. Whatever God has entrusted into our care, that is a talent that we have. In verse 15 it says, to one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, to another one talent, each according to his Ability. Two lessons here. Number one, the amount differs. All men are not created equal. Some get talents, some get more opportunities, some get more resources, and as we talked about this morning, some get more hair than others. So we all get different things, but we have been entrusted with something. The second lesson here is simply everybody has got some talent. You look at the story, you have a a five talent man, you have a two talent man, you have a one talent man. You do not have a zero talent person here. So each person has a talent. From the youngest to the oldest in this building, from the oldest to the youngest that's watching online, we all have been blessed with talents. We all have some talent, some more than others. In Romans chapter 12, verse 16, we each have been given different gifts according to the grace given us. I don't know if you've been told this yet today, but you're unique. Each and every one of you, you are unique. You are special. We all come from different backgrounds. We come from different experiences. Can you imagine if we were all exactly alike? I'm going to say that's going to be pretty boring. That that would be pretty boring. 
And so we're all different, and we play off of each other's strengths. We play off of each other's weaknesses. We talked about that in our last series, and being the body of Christ. We're not all feet. We're not all arms. But it takes all of us working together to strengthen one another. And so you are unique. If I looked on the, if Google didn't lie to me, you know, Google never lies. But if Google told me the truth, you are one in 7.95 billion people. There's only one of you. The next principle is the principle of accountability. God expects me to use my talents. He's made an investment in me. He has made an investment in you, and he wants a return. So what are we going to do to make the most of our lives? What are we going to do with what God has truly blessed us with? Whatever I have, I am to make the most of it. I'm not set here to make excuses, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But whatever God has blessed me with, then I need to have contentment in that. God has put me in this place at this time with this ability, and I'm going to make the most of it. And that is the principle of accountability. In verse 19 of our passage here in Matthew 25, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and the settled accounts with them. The master came back and an accounting was giving. Whether we realize it or not, because we live in a world that's so busy and sometimes we don't think about this, there's going to be a day that you and I are going to have to give an account Because Jesus is coming back, or we will be going to see him. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, we'll give an account. An account about what? Because people say, well, Verlin, I thought our sins are forgiven. 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sins. As a faithful child of God, it's not my sins that's going to be there that I've got to answer for because God has forgiven them. It is what did I do with what God's given me, the abilities, the opportunities, the resources. What did I do? How did I invest in that? Because he has entrusted us with so much. And I tell you, one of the greatest accomplishments is to figure out what your talent is or talents. But one that's greater than that, and then not just to find out what your talent is, but to start using your talent. That is the great accomplishment. And the next principle is utilization here. And that's simply, it's wrong to bury my talents. Let's compare these three men. You think about this. In verse 16, we have a five-talent man, and he goes out and he doubles his investment. In verse 17, we see the two-talent man. He goes out, he doubles his investment. And then in verse 18, we see the one-talent man. He went and hid his talent. Didn't double it. He went and hid it. He was cautious, he was conservative, he played it safe. His motto was nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's the way he lived his life. But can I tell you, God's given you some talents for you to be involved. He didn't give you talents to go hide them. He has blessed you with resources, opportunities, uh, finances, or abilities to do things for you to get involved in the kingdom of God and to bring glory to his name. Are we willing to do that? Are we going to go out and double our investment because we're putting it to work? Or are we going to go hide our talents? The choice is ours. The master's reaction, we see in verse 26, verse 27 there. You lazy, in the version that we read earlier, slothful, but maybe it's New King James Version, it says lazy and wicked servant. That is the sin of inactivity. That is the sin of passivity. When you bury something, what are you trying to do? You're trying to forget it. I just, I don't, I know God's giving me this, but let me put it over here for I don't feel so bad not doing something with it. And so I'm going to hide it. But can I tell you, if you bury your talent, you better watch out. 
Because again, look at what Jesus said. The master said, here, you lazy and wicked servant. And we go down there to the last part of that verse that we looked at. Thrown into outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever noticed who, um, the more you're involved, the more that you're involved in the works of the church, the ministry of the church, the less you complain? Have you ever noticed that? When we're involved, we, we don't have time to complain because we're busy, we're doing something. You know, there's a lot of times people will bring stuff to me, so I've got an issue you need to take care of. And I say, okay, tell me the issue. And they tell me the issue, and I say, well, what's the solution? I didn't come with a solution. I came to let you know about the problem. Well, why don't you tell me a solution here? Instead of just complaining about it, why don't we try to figure out how we can be part of the solution? Because when we get involved in things, things change. Now, you think about Nehemiah when he was building the wall there. Who was it that was complaining and griping and criticizing about the wall? Those that were not involved. And I believe the point that he's making here is I can't please God by playing it safe in life. Because you look at the disciples in the first century. They turned the world upside down. How? By playing it safe? No. By going out and proclaiming the gospel to a dying world. To those that didn't want to hear about it, they took risks. It could cost them, and it did cost so many their lives. Not because they played it safe. Not just because they came to a church building like this and sit here and don't worry about going out into the world. That's not what cost them their life. But it was living a life that brought glory to God. Proclaiming because they understood that there's people in this world that are dying and that's going to go to hell. And we want to be at the gates of hell trying to save everybody that we can from going to hell. Are we willing to do that? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Romans 14 verse 23, whatever is not from faith is sin. If you do nothing with the talents that God's giving you, that is inexcusable, period. God would rather us have tried something and for him and for his glory and fail than to try nothing at all. I may have shared this story with you, but this is the story that, that reminds me of this parable here. A gentleman was going, a preacher went to this town to preach a revival. And when he got to the town, he started seeing these targets and they had an arrow that was right in the bullseye. Every time he went around the corner, there's another one. He's like, my goodness, somebody is good. And so he started asking people, I, I want to see whoever is shooting this arrow and hitting the bullseye every time. I want to talk to this person. And people would laugh at him. And he couldn't understand what was going on. And finally, someone says, okay, that's old Joe down the road here. If you'll go down here, take a left, uh, and he's at that uh, gas station down there, and you can talk to him. He goes down there, and he says, so uh, I'm taking it, you're Joe? He said, yes, sir, I'm Joe. He said, so are you the one that are hitting the bullseye every time you shoot an arrow? He kind of looked at him and said, well, yeah. He said, but I do it a little different than most people. He said, well, what do you mean? He says, I shoot the arrow, and then I draw the target around the arrow. Is that not how a lot of people live life today? Is I'm just going to go out there, and I'm going to live, and hopefully it falls into what God wants it to be. But that's not the way that we need to do it, because I want you to understand, I would rather attempt something great and a fail, and then to attempt nothing and succeed. What are we doing? Are we trying and understanding what God says when God says, go for it. Make the effort. Do what you can. When my life is over, and if I have a tombstone, if anything could go on my tombstone, I would want at least this. At least he tried. He may have messed up, but boy, he tried to reach the community. He may have messed up and stumbled in the pulpit, but at least he tried. 
I want to do my best to do everything I can to bring glory to God and to reach people with the gospel, with the good news of our Lord and our Savior. Again, you go back to our parable here, and I want you to notice the person who is most likely to do nothing at all is the one talent person. I've met some, and I think this should be an oxymoron here, but I've met some unhappy Christians. I don't understand how being a Christian, how you can be unhappy. Because being a Christian, being a child of God, is the greatest thing in the world. But I've met some Christians that seem to be unhappy, that have lost their zest, that have lost their, their zeal. And, and, I, and I'm going to ask, you know, what would you do without God, though? If you're this unhappy as a Christian, what would you be without God? And what I've learned is these unhappy Christians are those who are just playing it safe, that are burying their talents, not putting to use what God has blessed them with. I want to be like Jabez. Jabez is in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. You start reading that in verse 1, and you see the father, the son, and go through all of this. You get down there in verse 9 and 10, and then you see Jabez. And, and again, his name means pain, but yet he says, Lord, Lord, enlarge my territory. Stretch me out. How many of us would pray that prayer? Lord, stretch me out. Enlarge my territory. Give me more opportunities. Give me more uh, chances to go out and to proclaim your gospel. Are we willing to do that? And normally we'll say no because we're afraid to go across the street to our neighbors. Lord, stretch me. Because you have blessed me in so many ways. The next principle is principle motivation. Fear keeps me from developing my talents. Verse 26, I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. Let, let me give you a list of three kinds of fears that keeps us from being all that God wants us to be. Number one is self-doubt. Okay, That simply is, oh, I could never do that. There's no way I could do that. I'm not qualified. Would you just please, preacher, get someone else to do this? Because this is this out, out of my comfort zone, out of my box, and I'm not willing to step out of my box. Again, this is self-doubt. It may be teaching a Bible class. It may be uh, being a teacher at VBS. It may be helping with lads to leaders. It may be leading a public prayer or the communion thoughts, leading singing or whatever it may be. But does 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 not say, not of the spirit of fear but of power? You know, some, so many times we doubt ourselves because I just don't know what's going on there. The second one is self-pity. And what that means simply is, Verlin, I, I failed before. I, I tried to say a public prayer, and, and I stumbled through, and, and at the end, I forgot to say in the name of Jesus, and I felt so bad that Jesus, even, or did God even hear my prayer because I did not do it in the name of Jesus, and so I'm just not going to do it again. Can I tell you, I've been doing this for 28 years. I fail in probably every time I stand before people in one way or the other, whether it's stumbling through words or whether it's forgetting something, or maybe even to the point of taking a verse that, you know, while I'm preaching, and you think, man, this, oh, per, a verse pops in your mind, that sounds good, and you say it, then later on you're like, that has nothing to do with the context. Sounds good, but in context, it has nothing to do with my lesson. How many times do we fail? Do we let that be an excuse? I used to tell our football players, that you're only a failure when you refuse to get back up. Get back up and go back at it. You can either be like Judas, go and throw you a pity party, or you can be like Peter, get up and shake the dust off and get back to work for the glory of God. The choice is ours. Because here's the thing, and I'm so thankful, and we talked about this just Wednesday night. Thanks to Calvary, I'm not who I used to be. God's still working on me. But it's not a matter of where you've been but it's where you're going. 
Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Abraham lied. Paul was having Christians killed. But yet, look at what God did in their lives. The third fear is self-consciousness. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says, The fear of man is a snare. We like to excuse ourselves by pointing to someone else that's more talented. Well, at Verlin, I would love to do that, but have you talked to Dale? Dale is a little more talented at that than me, so can you just probably get him to do it? Because if I could lead singing like Michael, man, I would get up there every Sunday, but I, I, I can't do that. So, you know, I'd rather not lead one song at VBS or wherever it may be. Let me tell you something, and I, I'll tell this to the kids. Did two weeks of camp. Ver, Mr. Verlin's no song leader. But Mr. Verlin got up the second week and led Pizza Man and had a blast with it. And we may have to do that again someday. But, you know, that's out of my, my talent zone. That is out of my comfort zone, but it's not about me. Why are we making excuses? Just because you can't do something spectacular don't give you an excuse to do nothing at all. Do what you can with what God has given you. In verse 24, it, it tells us that fear causes us to make excuses to do nothing. The next uh, one is application. If I don't use it, I will lose it. In verse 28, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. This is a principle of life here, folks. God has the right to take anything away from us if I'm not using it for his glory. He has the right to do that. That is a universal law because you think about it. If you get put up into a hospital and you're in a hospital in a bed, you can't move for eight months, you're going to have to learn how to walk again because you're going to lose your muscles. You're not going to be able to do things like you used to because that's part of it. I'm not using it, so I'm going to lose it. If I don't stretch my mind, I'm going to become dense. If I refuse to practice, then I'm going to lose my talent. I've challenged you with this, but this is where this thought came from, from this lesson right here. Whatever you need more of, give God more of that. You need more money, give God more money. And you may think, oh, no, I don't know about that. Try me. You need more time, give God more time. You need more abilities, give God more abilities of what you've gotten right now. Give him everything that you have because you cannot outgive God. Compensation. If I use it, I will be rewarded with more. Verse 23. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's business. There's a threefold reward right here. The first one is affirmation there, well done. And then you see the promotion. You have been faithful over a few things. And then you see the celebration is that come and share your master's happiness. You know, some of the happy pe happiest people that I know are those that are giving their life away for the glory of God. And unfortunately, the opposite is true too. Some of the saddest people that I know are hiding their talents. So as we close this morning, my question to you is, what has God blessed you with? What has God given you, whether it's resources, whether it's opportunities, whether it's uh, abilities, whatever it may be, what is it that God has blessed you with? Are you hiding it, or are you going out and using it for his glory? Because I promise you, if we're using our talents for God's glory, He's going to continue to bless us with different talents. If you look and say, Verlin, I don't have very many talents. Then take what you have and use it for the glory of God and see if God doesn't double those talents. But unfortunately today, in the world that we live in, is that we like to hide our talents because we're afraid. What if I need those for myself one day? It's not about me. It's not about you, but it's about us bringing glory to God to a dying world.
my prayer is that we here at Spanish Fort Church of Christ will take our talents and use them to the very best we can for his glory. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings that you have, that you give us. Thank you for your word. Father, thank you for this passage that we've looked at today. And Father, help us to understand that we have been blessed with talents. Every one of us has talents. And Father, help us to realize what those talents are. But Father, help us to go out and to use them for your glory, Father. And so, Father, I thank you for so many here that are using their talents like never before, that's bringing glory to your name, that are working and turning this community upside down for your cause, Father. But, Father, help us all to work as the body of Christ, using our talents. Because we don't want them to be taken away. And we want to use them in a way that we can bring souls into your fold. Father, thank you for what you've done with our talents. And thank you what you're going to continue to do. And Father, we give you praise and all of that. And so Father, today, we simply beg you, Lord, make us a servant. Make us like you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If we can help you, you can come as together we stand and we sing. Lord, make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant. Make me one too. Lord, make me a servant. Do so much for coming today and thank you for everyone that's joined us online let's go to god in prayer as we leave here father we thank you for this day lord um we thank you for the opportunity to worship you to come before your throne that you invite us to come lord as we depart from here help us to take the message that's been given and help us to apply that lord help us to take the opportunities that we're given every day help us to have the courage to go out and use those talents. Help us to resist any urge we have to bury them, Lord. Help us to realize we, when we glorify you, that you will bless us, Lord. Father, we love you. We humbly come before you. We pray all these things in your son's name, Jesus.